Hello, and welcome to Slice of Wine, the podcast that gives you the snippets of the people, places, and innovations behind the barrel. I'm your host, Amy Cronin, and today I'm here with Serge Lozac from Copke Winery. Um, Serge is the importer for Copke Port. Um, It's the oldest port house in existence and possibly has the most extensive collection of aged ports in the world. Um, Serge leads the, the marketing and distribution, and Serge, it is a pleasure to have you here on Slice of Wine today. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. <laughs> Me too. And we both, have our, we both have our flowery shirts on, so we're... It's that time of year. <laughs> uh, so first, I'd love to hear more about Kopke, um, or Kopke. I'm, I'm pr- mispronouncing it, right? Kopke. Kupke. Kupke. They in Portugal they say cup, but in the states we just say cupki. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll I'll go in back and forth between yeah. the Portuguese yeah. and the American, and <laughs> then just mess it up. Um, so this is like the oldest port winery, and port wineries are are, are quite old. It's so quite old, yeah. Tell founded me a in um, what well, were founded in 1638 by Mr. Kupki. Um, he was a trader. He traded in many things, and he saw an opportunity in wine, so he started buying wine and selling it. So at that point, it was, he was very diversified. He was, you know, anything to get his hands on, he would sell it. And uh, he was a trader. He, was, um, he would um, make money that way. The wine side of the business grew well. And mm-hmm. that was handed down for a couple of generations. And now, just to be clear, um, we're talking about port. You know, technically, it was just wine in those days. Um, yeah. After, you know, the, in terms of how port developed, um, the British market over years, not just for Mr. Kopke, but for everybody, Northern Europe in general, but the British market was huge. And, you know, the wines, they had problems because sometimes the wines would spoil, sending, sending back to England. Yeah. So they started uh, fortifying it to preserve the wine. And little by little, um, this became uh, so ingrained in the trade that by the 1820s, and again, they founded in 1638, it took almost 200 years for, for, from that wine business for the actual port developed, port wine with fortification. And that was made official in the 1820s, although it had been going on for quite a while. Um, right, from, the different, from the different it. traders just to stabilize it. But yeah. the actual, what we think of as port and all the rules and regulations and how it's done was really put together in the 1820s. So having said that, we've been around that whole long time. Um, Lawless and, uh, for the first 200 years. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the thing to remember about, um, you know, there's two different kinds of port houses. There is what we call British style mm-hmm. and Portuguese style port houses. A lot of the British-owned ones are into the ruby styles, especially vintage port, where it gotcha. aged in bottle. And mm-hmm. vintage port, the, the thing to remember, there's tawny port and there's vintage port, and there's ruby port. Right. Uh, ruby ports are, vintage port is a ruby port. Um, they're meant to age in bottle, so they're bottled very young, and they're aged in the bottle. They have more fruity characteristics, whereas tawny ports, what we will assume is a, a Portuguese-style product, as opposed to a British taste, um, are aged in barrel. So mm-hmm. the aging is done for you. They're oxidized in barrel over many, many, many years. Um, the British houses didn't necessarily stock a lot of goods because they bottled, they bottled very young. The ruby styles are bottled Going young. Yeah. The Portuguese houses, on the other hand, um, made a pride of their stocks. So they kept wine for a long time um, and they, 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 they prided themselves on those stocks. But that was, that was their commercial, you know, that, that's the whole thing. Those stocks are what makes you. Kupke yeah. being around for so long, we've still got stocks going back to the 1800s in small quantities, wow. of course, but we still have some stuff out there. So that's really the difference between a, a Portuguese style house and a British style house. It's not about ownership necessarily because, you know, things be what they are in the wine industry now. Ownership is global for a lot of things, although we are owned yeah. by, by a Portuguese company. So just to, to sort of refine that, like the, the mentality of the Portuguese versus the, the, the British. So the British were there, you know, the British owned port houses were there to basically, you know, sell wine quickly to the market, get it out there, whereas the Portuguese-owned houses were more about developing their style and their stocks. Is it so, sort of similar to the mentality of Sherry, where we're like, you know, we're keeping Soleras of many ages and the art is blending it? Yes, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's, about, it's about blending and it's about stock. Mm-hmm. So like with, like with Soleras and Sherry, you got to have a lot of stock in order to, to continually blend yeah. and to continually release that. So in Tawny Ports, and you know, there's, there's a couple of different qualifications. There's um, what's called aged port or statement of age, 10, yep. 20, 30, 40 on the label. And then there are colletas, which are single year. Um, sometimes they call them, some, some of the 
Porthouses market them as single year 20s in the States, which I think is a, is a mistake. The colletas. Colleta just means vintage in Portuguese. But since the term vintage is already taken in the port category, we don't use it. Got it. So colleta <laughs> so to avoid is confusion. really used for the tawny ports, whereas vintage is Oh, yeah, it's only 20 ruby. port. Exactly. Is used exactly. for the ruby ports. And that's how you can sort of tell the difference. Whereas, in, and then if you were to see a 50 year old or a 40 year old, well, actually, you're the only ones that have a 50 year old. <laughs> so, well, it's been approved by the government. We're the first ones to market. That's very cool. That's very Both cool. Both 20 and white. Nobody else has got white. That's our, that's our little ballywick. And, and the 50 year old, though, is it, it's not, is it a colheta? Or is it... Uh, no, no, those are blended wines. So uh, the, we'll call them statement of age. 10, 20, 30, 40, and now 50 has been yes. approved. Those wines are blended to be a certain style. It's a house style. Mm -hmm. So with let's say with a, a 10-year-old, you take that statement of age, 10 years old from the time it was bottled, by the way, because they're continually bottled every year. Um, every, the rule by the government is it has to have the, the qualities of a 10-year-old or of a 20 year old. So it's a very kind of amorphous rule. Yeah. Every house has their own style and every house has their own way to blend them. The, the master blender in a port house is just as important as the blender in a scotch house. So, you know, you've got, you know, the, you've got the, the vineyard manager, you've got the winemaker like in any winery, yeah. but in a port house, you know, right up with those guys and maybe more important is the master blender. So when you take that statement of age, we'll use 10 year old as an example. Mm -hmm. In our house, we'll use wines up to two years younger and as much as four years older than that statement of age to blend to make the 10 year. But the trick is that 10 year has got to be the same bottling after bottling. So it's a house style. So his job, his, his palate will change, but he's going to have to achieve that same style year after year as he blends those wines. Whereas a colheta, as again, the, the, the meaning of colheta in Portuguese is vintage. A colheta is a single year. So that's the expression and, of that year. Exactly. Now, the sourcing is a bit different as well. Um, on the 10, 20, 30, 40, we have our own vineyards, of course. Yeah. I'd say maybe 60% comes from our own vineyards. Mm -hmm. And about 40% of the, of the wines used um, for that purpose come from some long-term contracts that we have. Um, the colletas all come from our own vineyards. And not only that, but they come from the choicest vineyards at the top. So the colletas will generally have, um, will be a little less sweet and a little higher in acid, a little more character. Um, than the uh, the statement of age ones. And when you release a colletta, is it released with the um, like notion like you should be drinking this because we hold it until we you know exactly. we're ready to be released, yeah. or should we age yeah. it more? What's the so uh, uh, as opposed to a vintage wine where they age yeah. in bottle, where these yeah. guys can be you know you can ha have it for fifty years and open it, and that's when it's going to be at its peak. A colletta is aged for you. Now the rules are mm -hmm. that um, you can only release after seven years in barrel for a colletta. Uh, cup key holds 10 years minimum, wow. and then we start releasing. So now you don't, you don't just release everything. Uh, you, really, you do a bottling. Bottlings are done in succession. So we'll, uh, a 1960 Colletta, say that was bottled in 1970 as a, as a first offering, would be 10 years in barrel. That same 1960 um, might have been bottled again last year. It was in barrel that whole time. The label itself will still say 1960 on the front. Uh, you have to look at the back label to see the year of bottling, and that's oh. the key. Because that's a very different product now, because uh -huh. it's been all those extra years, but no, I'm 60 more years in barrel or 50 more years in barrel than that one that was bottled in 1970. A lot of consumers don't understand. Um, so it's, it's really the front of the bottle is going to be exactly the same. You have to look at the back and see when it was bottled. They don't age necessarily in bottle. Once they're bottled, they're made to drink. Okay. Um, they're not going to get, they're not going to, they're not going to go bad or anything. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly fine. They may drop a little deposit after 10 or 15 years. They may change a tiny bit. Um, yep. But the purpose is not for them to, ev to evolve in bottle. The purpose is not for you to save a colletta. The purpose for you is to drink a colletta once you bottle it. It's basically the work is done for you. Right. It's here. This is, we, this is how we exactly. want you to have it. Um, why wouldn't a, a colletta age more in bottle? Like what's prohibiting it to, from uh, well, it's already aging done. like it's a already... typical wine? So the, it's an, aging is an oxidative process. Mm -hmm. um, on a vintage wine, you cork that. There's going to be that oxidative process is going to go on, but much, much, much more slowly. Um, when you put these wines in the very large barrels, there's an oxidative process going on through the barrel, exchange mm -hmm. of oxygen, and it's going to be slow as well, but not quite as slowly as, as in the bottle. So basically what, we're, what the winery is doing is, is already oxidizing those wines for your pleasure. Now, oxidation can be bad. You know, you open a bottle of wine and it goes bad. Yeah. It's, it's been out. It's been open for a day or two. Um, but with, with 20 ports, colletas or otherwise, um, oxidative process is beneficial. 
is what we want to do. Yeah. So those wines are already oxidized. Now, by example, since they're already oxidized, a 20 port, um, you can open that and you can keep that baby in your fridge for six months. It's not going to budge. Yeah. As opposed to a vintage port, you open that and two days later, it's shot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that oxidative process is already done for you um, for 20 ports. That's that's the whole trick of, of 20 ports and especially Colletas. The Colletas, you know, the difference between Colletas and the Statement of Age wines is that the Statement of Age wines are made to a certain style every year. and They're going to be consistent. Colletas are, a, it's a, again, it's an agricultural product that's going to change every year. Now, you have a large, a larger, like a, most, most port houses that we see here in the U.S., you know, they might have like a 10-year and a 20-year possibly a 30 year and very rarely do you see cojetas um you yes. but you know you take a look through the the cup key portfolio and there is a huge amount of different it's about the stocks yeah. yes it's yeah. about the stocks and that's that's the benefit of being such an old house having focused on the portuguese style of of making port for so long um the i think the market is trending from ruby styles to tony styles in the last 20 years and mm -hmm. a lot of the um the other houses are playing catch up because basically they, they didn't they didn't save as much wine they didn't have as much wine in barrel as we do so a lot of them yeah. are buying up you know little little players and and buying stocks all of our yeah. stocks have been under our roofs for their entire lifetimes we, we have not purchased stocks to blend into our our wines um Krupke has been aging and holding stocks for for about 150 years already so it's, it's all under our roof it's what we've got <laughs> And because yeah. of that, not only can we do the you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, um, and now 50 tawnies without, without raising a sweat because we have the stocks to blend those wines, yeah. we also do that with whites. Now, the aged white is um, the redheaded stepchild of the port industry, um, yeah. but we, we basically have the market. No, there are some people who have stocks like ours in tawny. Nobody's got stocks like ours in white. And if you've 100%. ever tried the aged whites, they're fabulous. We do 10, 20, 30, 40, and now 50 in white which is unheard of. And we have uh, white colletas going back to 1935. Wow. In commercial stock that we're selling, not just like, ooh, it's, we, we're like selling it, this it stock. Exists. Yeah. <laughs> like, it exists. Like it exists and you can buy it. Yes, exactly. And in, in, 20, in 20, we've got about, I think right now, we've got about 40 different years on offer. Every year we have like 30 or 40 different colletas that we offer in our presale. Now, I mean, with such a vast portfolio and, you know, it, it, and this is all, I, I mean, it's, it's available, but you know we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of cases of, you know, a, a, you know, super, you know, unique wine, right? Or are you like is? Oh no, no, is no. It volume, <laughs> right? right. Um, I mean, the winery makes you know volumes um, yes. like that. No, but obviously we have all the entry level wines: regular fine ruby, right. fine tawny, um, reserve tawny, reserve ruby, uh, LBV. We make all the different, and there's a lot of SKUs in port. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of different types of wine. Right. Um, we make all of those. Um, but with something like aged port, the colletas, the volumes are much smaller. Um, volumetrically, we depend on the lower priced items, of course. Right. But how, how do you make these unique items available in the U.S. market and, and get them to the, the customer? Because they're, you know, uh, there's a lot of diversity. Um, they're, you know, it's unique. Is there, you know, what's the art of this and, and getting, it, getting it to the right customers or making it available to customers? Yeah, it's it's um it's a really unique position that we we find ourselves in. Um, mm -hmm. I took over the brand here in the states. I took over the importer basically. I run the importer for the states. Uh, Wine in Motion, it's called. Um, and um, the the first thing obviously is to get the right distributors. Yeah. Because you need you need those fine wine distributors to make this offering. The offering itself is the unique part. This is what we have in the U.S. trade that nobody else have is all these colletas. And what we do is we do a yearly presale. The winery produces what's called a short list. Mm -hmm. Those are the years that will be offered for sale that year that they will do a bottling run of. Um, and we put that onto a pre-sale. And with the help of our, uh, of our distributors, um, we get those out into the trade. Um, now, we have to have the right distributors to do that. Only the, the real good fine wine distributors understand how to do these kinds of pre-sales properly. Um, to, that, uh, to that end, we've actually um, reached a partnership this year with Skernik. And we're with Skernik now in eight markets. And right. we're, we're also working with, uh, with a few other fine wine distributors. And we're, we've got more coming on board soon. Mm -hmm. um, and it just gets better and better. So that offering, you know, that, that offering is the face of Cupkey. The volume, of course, is stuff like fine, fine tawny, fine ruby. That's where the volume is. But, but the actual face of uh, Cupkey and, and how we present ourselves to the trade are in those offerings, in those older colletas. So and it's all through years. 
Yeah. Through pre-sales to the distributors that then pass that pre-sell on to the, the retail. To their customers, and the right. And they, exactly. So that's, it's, I'll give you an example. Right now, those orders for, are due from my distributors. So I've had that, that pre-sale out since early May. Mm -hmm. The distributors have two months to collect all their orders and get the orders back to me. Um, and I need it this early because, as with everything else in Europe, they shut down in August. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I, got the, I have to get all those orders consolidated. That's going to happen the next week. Mm -hmm. We consolidate all the orders from our distributors. We put in our container orders. It'll probably be two containers worth of Colletas, which is all, you know, that's solid. That's a lot of wine, a lot of old wine. Um, and um, I need it that early because I need for the winery to prep it for shipping before they all go on vacation. The only people left at the winery during August are the guys that are responsible for, you know, letting the, 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 the shippers pick up the wine. So everything's ready. It's just sitting there ready. And the, the, sh the shipping part of the operation is there. But nobody else is there. So if that's not ready by the time they go on vacation, you have to wait till September. So you just mentioned something sort of in passing that I think might be kind of important. Sure. That they have to prep it. Like this isn't already, this isn't all. No, these aren't know, bottled. We, None of this is yeah. bottled. Yes. Yeah, so this is None all this in is barrel. This is, this is bottled to order. Th which is amazing. So. Yeah, it's, that's, that's how this works. And so, you know, once we get that order on the water, um, Hopefully, uh, and everything can go wrong nowadays with shipping, but uh, in a perfect world, it'll arrive to my warehouse in September. My distributors will pick up by October, and all the, the restaurants and the, and the retailers around the country will have their wine in November for the holidays. Wow. And then is there a focus more on retail versus restaurant or restaurant? Like for a product like this is, is um, you know, we, you sort of like in, encourage trial for restaurants and you encourage, you know, brand owners, you know, uh, uh, sales, like, you know, sales volume through, mm -hmm. through retail, where's the, where's the balance for a brand? So like that? I would say, um, I would say at least 60, 65, and this is numbers off the top of my head, but it's probably yeah. fairly accurate of, um, those volumes go to, uh, what we'll call carriage trade retail, better retailers, okay. fine, wine retailers. fine wine retailers. And, um, the best, the, the rest generally will go to fine dining. Okay. So that's, yeah. those are the targets for those products. Right, right, right. That's and then that, you have that's where your... those products end up going. The other question I have for you is um, white port. I mean, Ruby port's really quite well known. Tawny port, you know, Americans get that to a degree. <laughs> white port is kind of new, a new yeah. concept over here. So Now, for, for Americans, I'll give you an example. Yeah. Um, in France, just by example, France um, depletes more white port than Tawny or Ruby. It's a huge item. Really? Yeah, a, a white port in general, yeah. So white port is, uh, it, it's again, I call it the redheaded stepchild of the port industry. Which is funny um, because it's white. <laughs> and, yeah, and exactly. The are red. <laughs> <Except> <laughs> <for Tommy>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, there's there's several types of white port. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's made just like regular port. It's fortified to 20 20 um, percent alcohol, and that you know the fortification. And I'll just go into fortification. Excuse me, fortification very briefly. Um, uh, regular fermentation occurs, you know, just like any wine, you're fermenting. Um, and what they do is they add neutral grape spirit um, to the wine and during, f during fermentation, and that arrests the fermentation. So that boosts up the alcohol at the same time as holding the sugar where it was, which is why ports are so sweet and so strong. So in white port, you've got your three, you've got four types. We'll call it four types. Your three main types, which is fine white, dry white, and something called lagrima. Those, um, the differences there mostly are about when the fermentation is arrested. So with lagrima, lagrima is very sweet. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a not very well known item. It's a very sweet white port and the fermentation is arrested very soon to preserve the sugar, right? So then you've got fine white, which is your basic white, your everyday white port. Uh, fermentation is, goes on a little bit longer and they arrest it there. So it's not quite as sweet as lagrima. And then you've got my favorite, frankly, dry white, which is still a sweet product, but as compared to the other ports, it's drier. So they allow the fermentation to go on a little bit longer. So more of the sugar is eaten up by the yeast. Um, and, and then it's arrested. And then they all go to 20% alcohol. All the ports, all ports are like uniform, 20%. That's where they, that's where they go. Um, so dry white is my favorite. Those are, those are your three basic ones. Um, dry white is my favorite because it's um, the best to use in cocktails. And dry white is a great ingredient for cocktails. The most famous being the dry white and tonic. That if you go to Portugal, you'll be served dry white and tonic everywhere. Uh, they say with lemon, I prefer it with a with a slice of orange. But it's just basically a, it's a 
It's a highball, dry white and tonic. It's a fantastic drink. Um, you can think of it as, uh, as Lille a little bit, but only better. But you can, Lille, you know the product Lille, the French product? It can, be, you can, it can be substituted for Lille in any kind of a cocktail, or you can use it for other cocktails. It's, it's a great ingredient for cocktails. It's just also great to drink on the rocks with a slice of orange. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, when you're using something like a, uh, like a, a dry white port for a cocktail, um, it's a lighter cocktail. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not as heavy in the alcohol. It's, um, you know, oh, it yeah. has sort of like natural sweetness. You don't need to add the sugar, any sugars to it like you would, no. you know. Dry white and tonics are delicious. And again, you mentioned they're low in alcohol. So you can, you can sit on your porch or whatever and have three or four of those and you're not going to be sloshed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, the other, the fourth kind of white port um, is, uh, is basically the same as tawny port, except it's white. They use white grapes, is aged white. Okay. And that's where you So come. the process, yeah. So the process of making aged white is the exact same as the process of making 20. Mm-hmm. We also have, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year old blends. And again, um, a lot of wineries do 10 and 20. Some do 10 white, 10 year white. Very few do a 20. Yeah. We can do 10, 20, 30, 40, and now 50 because we have the wine to do it. Right. We have the wine in barrel from way, way back. And um, also yeah. white colletas. So we have a very, very strong white colletas program, um, program going back to 1935. And, and no, nobody else has this. That's, it's amazing. And 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 a white colletta would that would that wouldn't be used in a cocktail though. That would be more of a sipping. White. Yeah, you would. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to use that in a cocktail. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're just Unless like, I mean, you know, <laughs> knock yourself out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but frankly, I'd rather I wouldn't I wouldn't want to debase it that way. Yeah, no, no. So, um, but it and and so, how would you drink? Would it just would it be chilled? Would it be just chilled? By the way, yes, not only white but tawny port as well should always be served chilled. Mm-hmm. And a lot of a lot of people don't realize that they think it's a red wine you serve at room temperature. No, um, yeah. what you're looking at is something with something with a lot of sugar and uh, a good deal of alcohol. So you want to chill it, and that's when the the flavors come up better. Yep. Yeah, no, and I know. The same as the same as white. Yeah, yep. And and just to clarify, so uh, white port is it white because it's made with different grapes? Like, is white it, grapes? Yeah, it's yeah. white grapes. So it's so just, it's just are, the different. I think there are up to like sixty or seventy or more grapes approved in yeah. Portugal. So we're not going to get into grapes here, um, but there's you know, <laughs> but yeah. It, they're usually a blend, and there's usually a, a couple that, that are dominant. Um, in the reds, it's um, Tariga Nacional, uh, Tariga Franca, Tinto Roriz. Those are your, your three basic ones, and there's a ton of others that go in. A yeah. lot of the old houses are still doing field blends and such from 100-year-old vines, and God knows what's in there. Uh, the same situation with white. There's uh, Guveo and Malvasia and a couple of others that are probably the predominant ones. Mm-hmm. But sometimes God knows what can be in there, depending on the vineyard it came from. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Now, you mentioned something about, um, di- like, all of the colletas that you have and the different, you know, uh, ruby vintages, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. There is an art to declaring vintages because many different years could be vintage. But do you declare a vintage for each year? You know, how do you make that decision and sort of what's the process? So there's, there's two things. One, first of all, colletas also need to be declared, but we declare those every year. Okay. Um, but we, we may make more or less quantity in a given year. Um, now, what's important on, on that really affects the, the vintage port side is the declaration of um, vintage. So in a year where you're getting, you, there's a couple of things I really need to see before they'll, they'll declare it to the government. Um, color, very, very deep color. These are meant to age in bottle. And they want that color. They want those tannins. Again, it's, you know, they want, these are going to stay in bottle 50 years. Yeah. So you want those, those, those colors and those tannins and those rich, rich, deep fruits. That's what they're looking for. So if they see that in a given year, they will submit that to the um, uh, in- Instituto de Vino de Portugal or something. I forgot the, uh, the actual yeah. um, uh, name um, for approval. Now, they have to say, ah, oh, okay, this is... This is this is worthy of being declared, and, it's and you can a go ahead and declare that. That's there. I, yeah, it is. It's very rigorous. It's, now each winery has to decide whether or not they're going to submit their wines. Yes. So each winery will declare to the government. Then the government has to approve it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in other years where they don't um, declare vintage per se, what they can do is do a quinta, which means they will declare a our our, our vintage is called Saluis, where it would come from normally. So if we're not going to declare. What we can do is release a, a um, single Quinta vintage, which is a single vineyard vintage port. And okay. that, can, that the winery can declare anytime they want for themselves. 
Oh, okay. So we have so we have our vintage port, and we have our our Quinta San Luis. Uh, in the years where we don't declare the vintage, we we put out that. Now nowadays, it's not like it was you know a hundred or even thirty years ago. Um, technology is such that um, you know the, the and the knowledge is such that they can declare vintage ports much more often than they could. Um, even 30 or 40 years ago, because just, you know, the, the, the technology and the, and the know-how in winemaking and in viticulture has improved that much. They don't do it all the, all the time because they, you know, now they really reserve it for only the best of the best. Yeah. Um, but it's such that if, you know, a vintage port declared 50 years ago, they could probably declare that quality almost every year now. Wow. And is it just technology don't. or is it also, does global warming or technology? I mean, global warming may be a part of it because you want to, what you want to get is, you know, those, the heat does bring out certain things, but yeah. you know, that, that, uh, that could be a, a double-edged sword because if it gets too hot, that's not what they want either. But yeah. I think they're, they are kind of in a sweet zone now where they're getting crops that they could declare pretty much all yeah. the time, but they don't always do so. They'll save it for the Quinta. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in technology, I mean, port is such a historic, um, you know, wine that, you know, the technology 100, uh, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, I mean, you know, they were still stomping. Wine has great. changed dramatically. Yeah. yeah. Wine has <laughs> changed dramatically. Changed even, very dramatic. I've, even in the last 30 or 40 years is where it really took place. Yeah. Um, all over the wine industry. You know, you don't get you don't get that many. You get so much wine in the marketplace and they're drinkable. Yeah. Even you know, cheap wines, whatever, it's drinkable. You know, if you go back 50 years and get a bottle of cheap wine from 1979 or 1980, it might be total crap. Yeah, yeah. Um, because die. now the, the technology <laughs> is such that you can make a drinkable, serviceable wine yeah. anywhere you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Cupkey is much, much more than drinkable. It is... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> I wasn't talking about Cupkey. I was talking about no, the, no, industry, no, the yeah. others, the others, the others. Yes. No, no, no. But Cupkey is, uh, yeah. They've, you know, really the strength is the stocks. The strength is is yeah. what we've got in barrel in order to produce all these these wonderful wines. And not only the blended wines, but the single year wines, uh, as well as the, the general portfolio. It's great. Um, well, thank you so much for for being on the show today. I hope um, many people out there have the opportunity to to find and taste. Uh, some of the Colletas out there and some of the aged tawny ports that you have, um, you know, uh, get involved in a pre-sell if you can. Make sure your store has one. <laughs> um, I appreciate the time very much. And I look forward to tasting with you. Th me too. Next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sergey. Not alone. Thank you.